Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast, in which I bring you another rare find within the economics discipline. Before we've talked about superheroes, economics of Star Trek, and the economics of pirates. And in this week's episode, we have now the economics of games and the virtual world. This week's guest is Edward Castronova, who is Professor of Telecommunication and Cognitive Science at Indiana University, Bloomington. And Edward shares with us how he merged economics with his love of online gaming, which he discovered as an escapism from his daily grind as an economics lecturer. While playing online games like EverQuest, Edward soon found how a virtual world mimics the real economy. And he went about testing how behaviours have been formed to create a working economy in this virtual world. And from that, Professor Castronova's paper, Virtual Worlds, a first-hand account of market and society on the Siberian frontier, and that's Siberian C-Y-B-E-R-I-A-N, has become the most downloaded paper from SSRN and catapulted Edward into an expert on the economics of online gaming. You can check out all the links mentioned in this episode at economicrockstar.com forward slash Edward Castronova, or you can go directly to his own website, edwardcastronova.com, where you'll find links to his books and research papers. In this episode, we discuss numerous things, including his love for online gaming and how he discovered economics within the game EverQuest, how social inequalities exist within the game, about the casino model of gaming, where online games are free to enter, but you are encouraged to spend, and how this industry has recently exploded and where it's going in the future, whether online gaming can be integrated in the educational system for the betterment of teachers and students, and how online gaming experiments would be better than controlled experiments which would be carried out currently by researchers in economics, anthropology and sociology to test human behaviour, incentives and interaction. So enjoy this episode and as always I'd like you to leave an honest rating and review on iTunes and never miss an episode by subscribing. Also you can check out my Patreon page where you can learn how you can contribute to the show and become a patron and that's at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar. Hello Edward, how are you keeping? I'm doing okay. Uh, that's great, thanks very much for taking time out. How's everything in Indiana? Yeah, I'm in uh, southern Indiana on the, the front edge of the Appalachian Mountains, so Lovely. I'm in what Americans call flyover country. I say it's pretty scenic. Yeah, it's beautiful, very high quality of life, Nice. You know, great for kids, so I love it, it's wonderful. And a lot of greenery, is there? Yes, it's just gorgeous. So where where are you calling from? Ireland. You're so green also. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that came to my mind straight away when you said it's a a nice place and uh, to bring up children. And I suppose where you are, whether it's a city, people have their preferences, but it's always nice to have something like what you described. Yeah, it's the, the way to do it is to to live in a large, difficult urban environment when you're 25. (laughs) <laughs> get it out of your system and then get it out of your system and then come out to i think of it this is the way the elves live <laughs> <laughs> do you know uh, i was wondering how soon we'd get to mention elves or orcs or whatever and straight off the bat you're on within within two minutes of the conversation yeah right away <laughs> yeah look uh very interesting stuff that you do edward well, thank you you know it's it's absolutely amazing um i always love exploring different topics in economics and from what some people might call the weird and wacky mm-hmm. to the wonderful, I don't know, but I, I think you have what might have been perceived as weird a number of decades ago or even a decade ago to be, even though it's all based on virtual worlds, it is today a reality because we are all living in that virtual world and we like to get lost in it and whether you're introvert or introvert or extrovert we all like to take time out and explore yes. our devices whatever way whether it's social media or whether it's gaming or television even i mean i've been as an economist i've been thinking about what does this actually mean and one of the kind of puzzling things but i actually don't think it's puzzling but on the surface you'd think it would be puzzling is the work that I've done in virtual worlds about virtual economies and currencies and things like that, 
has had really no resonance whatsoever within the community of, of economics. And you might think, like, like it's not like I've been invited to far more anthropology departments, to public policy departments, to business schools, sociology, law. I've been invited to speak at a lot of law schools. And I really I can only count on one hand the number of times I've been invited to speak at an economics department. And so for an outsider thinking about that, it's like, well, that's a sociologist who's gotten some kind of a he has some kind of a public image and there are people who are interested in what he's saying. Mm. Yet it's like he's not getting invited to speak at sociology departments. But I, it's one of the reasons I love economics. OK, and, yeah. and it's because an economist looks at this and he says, OK, so you went into environment X and found that all of the rules and laws and theories of economics apply there. That's not interesting from the standpoint of our profession, right? Mm. So, I, and so I think that's the thing. People just look at it and say, it's not a big deal to report that, you know, people who go and play these games pay attention to the price of goods. It, you know, if it did, if it, if it was something that was like, wow, we've broken economics. Well, then economics wouldn't be a very good field. You know, the claims of econ are that, like, the theory should apply in ancient Athens. It should apply in contemporary Nigeria. It should apply in, in medieval France, right? The basic rules and theories should all apply in all those places. And those places are far diff more different from, like, life in Manhattan today than the virtual world economies are. So I think virtual world economies are, are just an interesting special case for the profession. They are, and I'd like to. I'd like you to take us back to the beginning of it all because I did read an article, an article, in that it just explained or discusses how you, as an economist or in a department of economics, and you found yourself taking time out to play virtual reality game or virtual games, and I think it was the game's EverQuest is what it was called. EverQuest, that's it. Do you want to take us back and how you got involved in that, and you know? And how the link with economics came about? Well, uh, so I'm an economist, but I, I wouldn't claim to be a particularly good one. As I got deeper into the profession and realized how important applied mathematics was, you know, it's just not deep in my skill set. I'm, you know, I would never make it as someone who does a lot of theoretical modeling. So I, you know, my career wasn't going well, and I was sitting out and. I was teaching at Cal State Fullerton. I was in a business school, and the role of the economics department there was just to teach economics service classes. So, uh, you know, I was teaching principles of micro three times a day. You know, I could walk in and say, oh, it's Tuesday, the third week in the semester. This must be sales tax, you know, and just sort of going through the standard textbooks over and over again. It wasn't particularly rewarding. And I was alone, right? I wasn't married, had no kids. And so I just said, to heck with this. I mean, I, I'm alive. I have enough money to live on. But my real world isn't that rewarding. I'm just going to play this video game. <laughs> it's, I really directed my life towards just hanging out inside this video game. And then while I was there, I noticed the economies, which you know you couldn't fail to notice if you're an economist. So I said, wouldn't it be funny? It started as a joke. Wouldn't it be funny to write a paper about these economies as if they were real? And and I thought that'd be good. It would be the kind of paper, you know, that gets passed around to graduate students. You know, every once in a while there are these these funny economics papers. I know that sounds strange, <laughs> <laughs> but they're they're funny in the sense of you know, like the incentives of people who play Jeopardy or something like that. Yeah, and be popular. So I thought oh, that that'd be a, a nice joke to play. And I started running the numbers and they just turned out to be really, really big. And um, so I decided to write the paper in a somewhat more serious vein. And then I just back, this was 2001 back then there's a, and it's still there. There's the, the working paper series that comes out of, it's called SACE EFO in Munich. Mm -hmm. And they were one of the first ones to say, look, if you put a working paper in our series, it's a free download. So I, I thought, well, what the heck? You know, I'll just, I don't think this paper has any chance of being published anywhere. So I'll just send it to this and just make it available on the internet for free. And it just took off. I mean, people just started downloading it and 
about within a month, I was getting calls from all these people, you know, in, in government and education and in the game sector and defense. Everybody's like, what's going on in this video game? Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I could either keep struggling in econ or I could just hook myself to this video game thing and see where it goes. And uh, and it's, it's been a great ride ever since. And it's the perfect combination. Like when you wrote that paper, Virtual Worlds, a first hand account of market and society on the Siberian frontier. And as you mentioned there, you didn't think it was going to go anywhere, but I think it's in the, the top three downloads on SSRN. Yeah. As of it's, today, like. Yeah, it's, it, I, even today, I'm still getting like the notification from SSRN, like, you're in the top you know, 3% of new downloads because of of that paper and some of the follow-ons. But again, I I think, you know, that's, that's a, it's not the the most accurate guide to academic or intellectual impact. Okay. So one of the, one of the effects here is there's a lot of gamers who are just downloading that to read it. Another is, you know, when you look at the, the top papers on that site, you know, people who Nobel laureates will write something and it gets like 10 downloads. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure that that's an academic effect. It's, but it, it's kind of a popularity impact effect, I guess you'd say. And it, it speaks to, you know, people in, it, let me explain it this way. Again, for people in economics and business, the fact that, that there's an exchange rate between virtual currencies and real currencies isn't particularly profound. I mean, you know, people will sell all kinds of things for real money. But for people in, like, cultural studies and, like I said, anthro and media studies and all these areas that are kind of more qualitative, the appearance of these numbers is it was like an earthquake to them. I mean, they, they were just like, wow, it's really real. Here's this person who uses real numbers supporting what we're saying. And, and so I, I think that's where most of the impact has been. In this game, EverQuest, do you do you still play it now, or is that long gone? Yeah. Have you moved on to something else? Yeah, I moved on. It's still there. And you're pro- you're probably playing World of Warcraft or something, is it? Well, I, I don't play those types of games for a couple of reasons. The first is once you get married and have kids, it's awfully <laughs> hard to sustain the connection that you need. Yeah. It, in order to kind of be a successful player, you really need to be part of the society that's there. And if you're you know, I, I'm much more concerned about my family than I am about things in a video game. So but the other thing is those worlds have changed a lot. And, you know, that's another topic completely about um, governance and politics. But basically, I do a lot of board gaming now because, you know, face-to-face gaming is really, really interesting. And uh, I also, I, I started to play what are called open world single player games. So it's like this massive environment, but you are the only sentient character in them. But you you can I mean you can walk around in there for ten years and it's just your world to explore. And they're just amazing. Mm-hmm. The latest one is that I, I recommend to anybody listening, it's called Kingdom Come. It comes out of Prague and it's like if you ever wondered what it was like to be in the fifteenth century in Bohemia Play that game. It is the most realistic historical recreation that I've ever seen. And you just got lost in this particular game? Yeah. I, I just, I go in, I'm the son of a blacksmith, and there's like this storyline that you can follow, but really, I, I just, I have this issue, like I need to get enough money to live on. So I go over here and do a job and get some money. And then I entered the noble service, so I get jobs as a soldier. And, I, you know, I enjoy just sort of like I'm a history nut, so I, you know, I, I just love the idea of being immersed in, in, in the world of a castle. Like you know, Ireland dotted with these these castles, and for an American to go and you wander through and you're like, wow, what must it have been like back in the day? And in this game, you're like, that's what it was like. <laughs> it's really cool. Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come, yeah. Maybe you'll get a, a couple of more people um, populating the the game. Yeah. Um, you know the, the the paper that that you've wrote based on EverQuest. Mm. Like, it was very interesting to see the statistics that you made comparisons with the city of Norat mm. and its GMP per capita. It's yep. the currency, as you mentioned earlier on, being worth more than the yen or the the Italian lira at the time against the US dollar. 
And mm. like I've had previous guests on this podcast who spoke about the economics of pirates, the economics of superheroes, and <laughs> you know, I think on Star Trek as well. So mm. there's there's a link there with this type of interest that people have at a personal level and how they can link it into economics and make it more interesting for people to learn because with economics it's it's a, it's a theoretical model built on principles and we try and apply that to real world and no better place to test people's behavior whether you're an anthropologist or an, an economist than looking at games and virtual worlds and see how people behave and interact with one another and yeah. how a currency or a, a particular product is valued yeah, I, I actually see a couple of themes in your comments. One one involves using these worlds for experiments, and I'd like to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Um, but the first one was just there is this surprising fact that economies are present in almost all fantasy games. And you might, you know, as an economist, when you go to a wedding and people, oh, what do you do? What's your line, son? And you say, I'm an economist. Everyone says, oh, I hated it. It was awful. It was mm-hmm. the most boring thing ever. And yet you look at the places where people go to escape and it's filled with, you know, markets and and labor supply and technologies of production and crafting and and transportation and all this, you know, all this economic stuff. And and it, I wonder if the profession isn't kind of missing, missing something in, in like, wow, we could we could make this a very, very popular profession if we, if, you know, if we sort of took advantage of we understood what it is about economics that people really like. So I've thought a lot about that. And I think what's going on in the fantasy worlds is the concept of economic independence. It is really fun to be an independent economic actor when there really isn't any risk of failure. You know, you're not going to starve. Hmm. And I think that's what people really enjoy is to, is to be able to sort of, play around with resources, discover something new. And, of course, they're designed so that your wealth grows. So just just playing in, in wealth growth games is, is pretty fun for people. And, um, and, in fact, it's so fun that very few games that, that I've seen have no economic component whatsoever. There's always – in fact, in the industry, they, they speak openly of resources or currencies. Actually, they, they use – they stopped using resources. They talk about currencies. And what they mean is, you know, what are the tokens that limit activity in direction A? Okay, that's token A. And then there's another kind of token that you need to go in direction B. And that's token B. And they'll talk about do, how many how many currencies do you have? Four. We have three. And sometimes it's, it's gold pieces, so it has that kind of a label. Sometimes it has a label like uh, you need this much iron ore or you need this much mana to cast that spell. And so... This business of, of sort of managing your portfolio across the different currencies is effectively what players are doing, you know, a, a good chunk of their time, 30 to 40 percent. And it seems to be really satisfying to do that. So that's that's something, you know, that could be thought about, like psychologically. Why, you know, why is that so much fun when we interpret the real world economy as so miserable? Yeah. Yeah. If you do you want me to just keep rambling? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because the other theme was the idea of doing experiments. And I, 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 since, you know, for 15 years, I've been saying we should spend about one one hundredth of we, of what we spend on physics experiments, on social experiments in virtual world. So we spend something like, you know, $10 billion to throw particles at one another. And, and that's wonderful. You know, I'm glad we do that. But if we spent, like the, the, the cost of one of these really big super duper games is like, you know, 250 million, let's say something like that over the course of five years. If we spend that amount of money to do social experiments, I think, you know, the payoff to that would be huge. I think the marginal benefit of the Higgs boson is probably not too big. The marginal cost is massive mm-hmm. in the physics direction. If you go in the social experimentation direction, the costs are you know, orders of magnitude lower. And I think the potential benefits are orders of magnitude higher because most of the problems that bother us today are, I mean, you know, solving particle problems isn't, you know, what's causing people misery right now. It's things like religious warfare. You know, it's things like 
everybody on the globe solving the political problem of dealing with the climate that we all share. Yeah. It's it's things like xenophobia. So, you know, you could do all kinds of interesting experiments about, like, how do you change people's minds? We have not had that capability in social science ever, ever to do controlled experiments like the natural scientists do. And I mean real control. So you could build one of these world, worlds and then through copy paste, create 10 versions of exactly the same world, exactly the same in every every way. And then you randomly populate it with you know different people. People come into the system and they get randomly assigned. And then you could do, you know, policy interventions in in the nine worlds. You have the control and then policy interventions. You'd have direct causation with populations of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people living in a persistent society. And think about how that contrasts to the standard experimental method in social sciences, which is we're going to have 27 college students watch a video or play a game theory game for 20 minutes. And then we're going to give them a survey and then we're going to publish a paper about how the the intervention affects human nature. You know, that's ridiculous. I, I think that's kind of it's very hard to capture something like that. Yeah. No, nobody believes that. Nobody. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's but if you said if you said and even the sample size is so small, then if you want to yeah. compare it to a population, you know, a decent population. Yeah. I mean, what if what if someone just told, you know, social scientists out there, listen to me. We have a tool right now, the technology exists, where we could do controlled experiments on populations of tens of thousands of people over the course of years without violating any ethical constraints. Like I'm talking massive field experiments on on issues across the social science spectrum. Think about every paper you've ever read by somebody going at something from a macro social perspective saying, well... It would be interesting to run a controlled experiment on this, but unfortunately we can't do it. So here's our time series regression. Well, guess what? Now we can. But I've tried many times to get funding for this, and it, it's a tough sell because people say, what? That amount of money? That's too many zeros for a grant. Mm. So, But I'll keep pushing. And the thing is, when people are represented by an avatar, like there, some psychologists would give puppets, for example, to people, and they would ask them to have a conversation with one another through these puppets. And what the psychologists tend to find is that people's true uh, characteristics come out through the puppets because they're kind of masked behind them and they mm -hmm. behave in what they believe is their normal state. But when they're face to face and they don't really know the people around them, they kind of are more reserved. And if you have an avatar and you're playing in a game uh, and you're interacting with people or you're, you're behaving in ways that allows you to express yourself, say, socially or something like that. It tends to give you a more true and accountable and more transparent picture of how people will behave in a, a certain experiment. Like, for example, there was a, I read on an article based on something that you studied, uh, you actually, um, based on EverQuest, I think it was, and people building up their, they, they all start off at the basic level. I think you're skinning, rabbits and rats and so on and they have to sell these skins and eventually you kind of everyone has that type of e equality starting off in a game but there was a homeless person who actually had a very wealthy existence in this virtual world and when someone contacted this person through it they found out that this person was actually homeless homeless and the only possessions that they had was a laptop that they worked on or they that they played the game on for example uh, i don't know anything more about that but uh, it just shows how, on in a virtual world, the this I suppose the the whole existence is flipped for this individual. And would you well, find that to be the case in certain? Would you think it'll be more true to to research or science that people will behave in in a truer state? I suppose in when they when they have an avatar in a particular game, whether you're an elf or an orc or a wizard. Or, well, the research I've done so far indicates that, you know, when people put on an elf hat, they still pay attention to the law of demand. So there's sort of that small scale evidence, but it doesn't seem that people lose economic rationality when, when they do this. And, and the other thing, the other point I would make is when we're looking at large populations, right, the law of large numbers starts to kick in. And, you know, economists will, will always make the argument that, 
well, I know you have an Uncle Joe who's economically crazy, but I have an Aunt Jane who's economically crazy. And so long as the the bias is symmetric, it doesn't matter, right? The, the two types of craziness uh, cancel each other. And I think the same thing would happen. You might have someone who goes into a virtual world and says, in the real world, I'm a librarian and I'm very quiet. But in this world, I'm a I'm a barbarian and I destroy everything. You say, well, they're not acting like they are in the real world. Well, you know, there's somebody else who's a barbarian in real life who's acting like a librarian in the yeah. virtual world. And if the data, which has shown so far, if it seems to indicate that the, the, the massive decisions on the whole act like economically rational people, then I think the virtual environment is completely valid. Yeah. For these experiments, uh, what what I kind of meant was, um, you know, the way you do it. If if you carried it out in a class experiment with student twenty seven students, they wouldn't they'd be more reserved and they may not be as open and interactive with the experiment. But if they were hiding behind an avatar, their yep. their true characteristic and their, their the better experiment would be performed as a result, and then you would have very similar outcomes based on what we might have assumed or hypothesized regarding economic theory. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that completely. I mean, it's, it's almost like there, there are too many reasons why this might make sense. <laughs> you, you know, in order, in order to say that the, the activities in the virtual world are not relevant for the real world, you have to argue that something weird about, you have to say that people systematically, like the entire population of people, when given puppet faces, completely distort their decision making. And I think that's a tough argument to carry mm. just just from the standpoint of, you know, like you said, it's like it's you relax when you have a puppet face. You don't have to be working on being different. Right? You, you tend to just let yourself be yourself. What is your favorite avatar that you've ever <laughs> used? Or I know you said you're a son of a blacksmith in the current game. Yeah. Well, all right. So. I don't mind sharing this. I have an, an online persona. A, a lot of people from the early days of the internet, you know, you'd get like a, what's called a handle. This is probably so, a bad question. Is this is like asking you your salary or something? Is this it, me <laughs> asking you what your avatar is? Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's, it's the, the persona is, I, I made a, a character called Komalan in EverQuest, C O M O L A N. And that's because I have a real, a, a real sort of passionate, almost a, a religious following for St. Columba of Iona. And so I was trying to find a a fantasy name that sounded like the Irish monk saints, Coleman and 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 uh, Columba. And, and, and you know, they all they have the C starting sound and they have M's and L's. And so I was looking for something like that because I like to play priests. Okay. And so I made this character, Comalon, who was a healer a priest, a cleric, as they call them in that game. And ever since then, it's like if I have the opportunity to sort of build a character, I tend to build them towards healing and resurrection and, uh, you know, divine, you know, speaking to the divine, talking to gods, helping people with moral decisions, things like that. And so I've carried that persona through. Now, it turns out in Kingdom Come, the you don't, you don't have the char- quite the character building opportunities so I'm not really building Comalon right now. For example, the character is named Henry. You can't change that. <laughs> but whenever possible, I try to build my characters that way. Like when you're not role playing, but when you're playing in this multiplayer online role playing game, do you have to spend money like the way online games would be now, where you have to buy, like, say, fee books when you're playing Fortnite Battle Royale or something to upgrade certain skins? Or is this something that you do when you make something and then trade it with other people and you build up your wealth that way? Do you ever have to spend your own U.S. dollars on uh, making uh, – because I know there's a, a possibility for people to do that and they can come in and on eBay it was mentioned that they could actually buy certain weapons or um, staffs or outfits and so on and characters and get in the game I, at a higher level. Yeah, I, I think it's it's socially interesting, and so that it's it's socially significant that the the revenue models of the game industry have changed. So when I first started playing, I thought it was a very fair system. You paid a certain subscription and you got to play for a month. You got the whole game for a month. 
Um, and the other model is you pay once up front and you get a set of game content and you have that forever. So game companies discovered right around 2010 or so they could make a lot more money with a kind of what I would call more the casino model. Okay. So what happens at a casino? Everybody walks in for free. You get quite a lot of free content. You can, you know, sometimes there's free food, a lot of time free drinks and, you know, and, and so you get all this free stuff. You're like, well, how do they, they afford that? Here's how they afford it. There are a few people who walk into a casino and spend hundreds of thousands of euros over the course of, you know, three hours. The casino makes all their money off of those people, but they need you to be there so that those people feel special. Mm-hmm. And games are starting to do the same thing. So it's called the free to play model where almost anybody, really anybody with a computer can come in and play a huge portion of the game. And then you have these opportunities to do things like, you know, buy special armor or, you know, somehow make yourself look better and sometimes even play better, be more powerful by spending real money. And and that economy works the same way. There are these whales who come in and will spend $10,000 a month just, you know, buying the best stuff for their character. And that's enough. They And the companies get way more revenue from that model. And then the, the latest innovation that's really got people troubled is why why should we say to say to the players, hey, you know, give me a hundred dollars and I'll give you a super duper horse. <laughs> Instead of saying that, it's like, give me a hundred dollars and I'll give you a lottery ticket for an even better horse. And apparently that really sucks money out of the wallet. When when you tell when you tell players that they're like you add a basically a gambling component. You tell players if you spend a certain amount of money, you get a chance to win a new car. <laughs> and and that's what the loot box system is. And boy, does that have the potential for really drawing people in and getting a lot of money money out of them. And so I'll tell you, I stay away from those games. They're money sinks. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a big industry at the moment, and I can only see it getting a lot bigger as well. Oh, wait until the alternate reality stuff starts. Yeah. So there was the the Pokemon Go craze, where I'm sure everyone around the world had their kids running around saying, "Oh, I caught a you know a Pikachu or something," mm-hmm. and that that was a, a foreshadowing of you know I, I I consult with companies, and you wouldn't believe the projects that are out there that are sort of linking blockchain technology to alternate reality entertainment stuff. So, you know, you go to the Eiffel Tower and, you know, you, you see all this content and and you pay for it. You know, imagine this, you're, you're at a school, you're, your kids come back from school and say, everybody else at school was able to, you know, chase the golden goblin, but I couldn't because you won't pay for this downloadable content. Yeah. <laughs> so... That's like when we were younger in, prim- in uh, primary school in Ireland, when we were about, say, seven or eight, and these magazines would come out at Christmas time. And you were encouraged yeah. to, not encouraged, you were encouraged to buy them because you'd do some of the activities in the classroom. But if you didn't get it, you're left out and you have to do your maths or uh, your Irish or your English. And the peer pressure is on in order to get this little magazine. And, and- nowadays, the pressure is immense with these games that are available at the fingertips they're great you know i i personally think they're great to to play these games but you can really get sucked in it because when you're playing online with other friends my my child for example kid for example has uh friends who are playing the xbox online and they have different skins and different moves and dances and he's at the basic level and we've only got this game there recently and he already it's like kind of have five dollars to buy a new skin and a, a new glider and um, kind of have more money to get this and that and the other and upgrade it, you know? So it always, the pressure is there already. And you can hear the kids on the other side. He said, oh, he, um, one guy's after asking his father for money to buy certain V bucks virtual, this virtual currency that's on this particular game. So they're all kind of listening in on each other and they're telling, saying what they have and what they don't have and things like that. Well, and I, I have the same problem with my kids. And here's what I recommend is you say, well, you have an allowance every month and I'll let you spend this fraction of the allowance on virtual items and games. But I, I really stir them, steer them away from anything cosmetic. I tell them, you know, I'm happy to buy you a game where there's a fair pricing scheme where I pay for something 
and you get experience. But I, I will not. I'm not going to pay for gambling, and I'm not going to pay for cosmetics. Now, if you want to spend your money on that stuff, you go ahead. And I've had that. My kids learned some lessons about you know spending their money on a game, only to have their whole friend group decide they don't want to play that one anymore, oh. and the money's gone. Right. So there's, I think, you know, this is, we've found this in video games in general is that is each generation, like the kids discover it first. And then when their parents, society will have adapted and will not be sort of taken advantage of in this way anymore. <laughs> so, but it's, it's a generational thing. Parents now have, have really got to resist that model, I think. Edward, um, you know, how, how can we, Based, I know we touched on EverQuest earlier on, but just going back to it, if you don't mind, what can we sure. learn from platforms like this and relate it to, say, capitalism or Marxism? If there's, uh, yeah. you said that the the programmers or they, I think you implied that the programmers, if they had set up the, the copy and paste of the game multiple times, and they could actually dictate and see how. The games of all different different states or different environments, and how people mm. uh, adapt to, to those. And is there an, examples whereby we could relate, say, Adam Smith's works or Karl Marx's work, in, in some of these these examples? Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of interesting stuff that's happened by way of natural experiments. So, in fact, I, maybe I should write a paper about this. There's enough different examples. So, all right. So going way back, there have been developers who have said, we're going to make the libertarian world. You know, we're just going to create anarchy and let the best win. And uh, that game is called Eve Online. And what evolves in worlds with that kind of anarchy is uh, mafia rule. So the players divide into these guilds and um, the guilds take, take control of different space in the world and they pretty brutally run it. You know, this is, it's a, it's a world where there is no law. So anybody can kill anybody and there's no recourse so that you could spend a year building a ship. It's a space game and a, a year of your time building a ship. And if you run afoul of this mafia clan, you, you know, they'll kill, you know, destroy your ship. And so you really don't want to do that. <laughs> and, and so there's that kind of anarchy. Um, there have been efforts to create kind kind of idyllic communal worlds they've all failed they've all just failed miserably there have been efforts among players to do that sort of thing and you know people who are political economists understand exactly why it's the same it's the same problem that always happens with any kind of communal sharing is that well somebody has to decide who gets what at the end of the day and any kind of dream of of communal distribution really relies on how much do you trust the people who are running things. So, and those people always turn out to not be reliable and, or, you know, the, the people who are, who are kind of down below start disliking what's happening at the top. I mean, and this actually continues. I had a young man come to my office because he wanted to consulting about, he was going to make, I won't share anything. He, he was going to make a virtual a, a com communication space that people could be in where they could be completely free of all the cultural norms that surround us. And, and he, he was like, and when I make this, we're going to make a new culture. We're going to create a new culture where people are kind and, and we're not stuck in this culture that we're in and blah, blah, blah. So, he, you know, he had basically the Marxist model that there are these, these powerful people at the top of society who are forcing us into this culture and all this oppression. If you could just take the oppression away, that humanity would bloom in all of its, you know, unicorn and rainbow happiness. And, I, you know, I, <laughs> you, you know, you're the 77th person who's said that this is going to happen. And I remember the first time somebody, it was an, an artist collective, we're going to make a virtual world where anyone can come in and they're, we're all going to, you know, co-own everything and it's going to be co-regulated. And I remember a really jaded virtual world developer saying, asking them, now, suppose someone comes into your world and decides they want to be the dictator and start seizing everything and kicking people out that they didn't like. Would you allow that? And they're like, no, no, of course not. But of course, moments before they'd said, we're going to let people do anything. Mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you really, you, I, I said to this young man, I said, you can't avoid the problem of governance. And has it ever occurred to anyone that the reason we have oppressive cultural norms is precisely in order to allow us to be free? Right. This, this view that freedom comes from not having, not having rules is wrong. Freedom comes from having rules, having good rules, having law. Law creates freedom. The absence of law creates oppression. Mm -hmm. So that has been shown over and over again in virtual worlds. And the latest, okay, so the, the, the number of people in the game industry who've tried to create new societies, like they, they really wanted to do it and they've become so frustrated governing people that they have abandoned governance. The most popular multiplayer games right now are called Pick Up Battlegrounds. And it is Leviathan. It is Hobbes, Red in Tooth and Claw. A Pick Up Battleground is you are dropped in there by yourself with a thousand other people and you're going to kill each other until one person is left standing. Mm. People love that kind of game. <laughs> you know, they, they, they enjoy it. And, and you see how the game companies like we're going to, we're not going to bother trying to govern. In fact, we're going to throw you into, a, you know, it, it's the Hunger Games, kill each other. And everyone's like, yay, we get to, we get to go in and do this. So uh, I think we've learned a lot about governance from the various experiments that have been made. And guess what? All the cynical conclusions that people have made in the past, those are all the right ones. And, and it's true because if you try to create this utopian place, Within, I, I don't know, within a month, within a year, it'll be a totally different place than when you started out with. Yeah. Whatever type of environment that you would ideally have in the real world, that was once there, I'm sure, and it would probably ended within five minutes of yeah. that utopian state. This has happened on the internet over and over again, where the environment is great so long as only the people who started it are in there. And then once ordinary other people come in, it starts to decay. And what frustrates me is that, you know, the reason would suggest that the way forward is not removing rules and constraints, but trying to innovate and find better rules and constraints. I, I would love to have a competition with, again, this sort of multiple virtual world thing. And I would ask the social democrats of the world to sit down, representatives from different countries, design the economy, the politics in your world. Oh, Marxists, here's a world for you. You decide what you what is in. Oh, libertarians, here you go. Social conservatives, here you go. Oh, Catholic Church, you 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 design whatever you want. You know, people who like guns, you design. Them. <laughs> and and kind of you know create worlds and let the different ideologies design whatever kind of system they want, and then see what happens. Mm -hmm. I I would love to see the results of that. And like even you mentioned in one of your papers there about social inequalities, they do exist even though everyone starts off equal. And you found it more so between men and women that if you were to sell their avatar, women's avatars are actually 10% less than the male ones. And even though you might be a man with a female avatar, you still find it hard to advance in a game. And but, but however, you also get free stuff in terms of the chivalry of other male avatars in the game. So whether you're male or female playing a game with a, a female avatar, you do still have that inequality that does exist in that virtual world. Yeah, we're never going to be able to get away from equal inequality. And we and if you think about it, you know, economics teaches you don't want to because there's a there's a distribution of interest in money. Not everyone is interested in having material wealth. So what happens in virtual worlds is people come in with a complete, you know, they all start with nothing and then they make choices. And some people make choices to really spend a lot of time getting powerful and rich quickly. And they go right to the top of the income distribution and other people, they'd rather spend their time socializing. Uh, they like to explore the environment, even though there's no quest to do it. They just want to go to the top of the mountain and, you know, those people have lower incomes and less power and nobody complains because they all know that they started equally. Mm. So it, it's interesting. It, it, the experience in games is that inequality of outcome is completely acceptable to people. Apparently, if equality of opportunity is assured. So it kind of says something about, you know, if you wanted social peace, 
the things to focus on policy wise are not redis- redistributing current incomes so much as making it so that everyone feels like they got the same chance. And, and, you know, maybe it's also, you know, you have to kind of remind people or make people bluntly aware of the fact that their current status is the result of choices that they made. Cause that, that's really obvious in a video game. If you, if, if two people start the game at the same time and within three weeks, one of them is level 50 and the other is level 12, the level 12 person simply cannot point a finger at the system or anyone else. I mean, they know they just haven't done whatever it takes to get to level 50. Mm-hmm. And I don't know kind of what you would do in the real world to make people be at peace with that reality. You know, I, I have students who, who say, like we have, I'm in a uh, media school here and we have journalism students. And the journalists, I've talked to them, I say, you realize it's kind of a tough world out there for journalism and this one young lady said yeah i i know but i just love writing and i i'm just going to do this well great i hope when she's 35 and you know working at the kinkos that she's not resentful about the world (laughs) because you know it was her choice so it's kind of like the video games because of the way they're set up they resolve or they kind of they sort of defuse a lot of the resentments that we have in the real world. And so I wonder how can we make the real world so that people would be happy with their start in life, you know, so they felt like that was fair and then also be happy with their outcomes and say, well, that's fair too. You know, I got what I, I got what I chose. You know, you're right there because there are people that are so fixated on their career choice and the build up to it. And I do think it becomes pretty much an anticlimax, as you mentioned, by the time they're possibly were at the age of 35. And it's rare that you have somebody who is very happy and very pleased with their, their chosen career path. And I do think something like an escapism, escapism, whether it's board games, virtual, virtual games or virtual worlds, playing sports, whatever it is to allow that appreciation, whether it's art or music, keep that up. And you never know where that could uh, lead you to for example i love your website edwardcastronova.com and within that there's a lot of content excellent content and there's one there with a guy sitting at a desk playing his computer game and it's titled games and the future of low skill work and there's perhaps with high levels of unemployment today in the western and in, in all in all countries there might be a chance for some kid who's playing games to actually now make a living on it like mm-hmm. there's a guy, uh, Ninja, he's, uh, he's on Twitch and he's earning 500,000 US dollars per month on uh, mm-hmm. playing games and streaming games live. And YouTube is allowing you to do that. Twitch is allowing people to do that. And obviously, if you were put that in a distribution, they're very much at the, the top tail end at that extreme 0.001% of uh, gamers who are actually making a living like that. So maybe it uh, pretends to try and say that people can actually make a living out of this, like the way acting or the, if they were uh, playing music. But there is a possibility to get lost in that. Yeah, this I'm, I'm more interested in what's happening. You know, I know that some people are are capitalizing on the way that TV viewing is changing, and just just to sort of catch everybody up on that, the way young people are watching TV is. You know, they don't watch cable or anything. They just open up their devices and they open up Twitch or YouTube. And they, my my son will watch other people playing games for four hours, mm. and and that creates income for people who are really good at being entertaining while they're doing that. But you know, and and that you know these ridiculous you know five hundred thousand dollars a year, but a month, a, a month, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's but, you one know, person. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to start a Patreon page because I've heard that there are professors who make 5000 bucks a month just from folks saying, you're a good professor. You know, I'll give you $10 a month. Yeah. So, I, yeah, it concerns me is not the $500,000, but that someone can make 300 bucks a month by doing things like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, games are already starting to give people small little payments and rewards for coming and playing. So imagine – a young man, he's unemployed, and anytime somebody says, "Well, you're unemployed," he's like, "No, I'm doing internet work." Mm-hmm. Right? We're starting to hear that more and more. Okay. And it's things like you get money for going to a random site and entering a, a comment that says, "You know, oh, I agree. I love what you posted. You should really try 
you know, FedEx.com. Or <laughs> people, people are getting paid to do things like that. And ask yourself, how, how much money does someone need who's single, doesn't live in a big city, and wants to, you know, make money on the internet and just play video games? It's not a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And I think over the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to see more and more unskilled young people, mostly men, who spend almost all of their time sitting in a comfortable chair with a VR headset and just having a great time playing games and making just enough money to support themselves, to get food in the door, to have a cheap apartment, you know, to, to, you know, shower every once in a while, (laughs) but basically spend 24 hours a day in that chair playing those games. And I think with the trends I'm seeing with automation, I I think the number of low skilled men, who will find that kind of lifestyle attractive. I think that's going to go through the roof. It's going to be millions and millions of people. And, you know, that can have implications on whatever other, you know, say, for example, health. Mm-hmm. You know, as you said earlier on, there's economics pretty much everywhere. You know, people who don't like economics and they, they say, oh, that subject, I didn't like that in school or college, but mm-hmm. they still participate in it. And, you know, we can see that in those negative implications of somebody who's sitting there. Um, we can obviously see the positives as well. I know you on a YouTube um, on your TED talk just just below your TED uh, link. You also had Jane McGonigal. I actually saw that about two years ago, and um, where she spoke about how you could use online games or uh, virtual games to bring that into your life uh, in order to avoid say, or not avoid, but help you get through the day if you're suffering from depression and turn your life into a virtual game and trying to make certain uh, small steps in order to make those achievements and get through the day. So uh, you can see the positives of it then as well. Yeah, there. it's like any technology. It, it really gives us more power and we can use it in a good way or a bad way. So one one issue about like people sort of going off on this exodus into virtual reality. First of all, we have to step back from that and say, let's not automatically blame them. I mean, one of the reasons people enjoy video games so much is because the real world has become so meaningless. So, you know, we could stop and think about the world that we've created here that has no good, no evil. No. I mean, it's just a lot of yelling and power politics and we don't share any notion of like what the universe is like or what the meaning of life is so there's an awful lot of un- people who are i would say metaphysically unrooted they're just sort of wandering around like well this isn't you know there's no reason to do anything in the real world then you go into a video game world and the message is you are important we need you to go do this thing there's a bad thing over there and there's a set of actions that are gonna be hard for you but but we are relying on you to go and do that. We need a hero, and you're our hero. There's, you know, that says something about our real world that people would rather be fake heroes than, you know, out here, out here in reality. So, you know, I'm not. I, that's kind of why I see video games as almost therapeutic in a response to a real world that has really done a poor job of making people feel wanted. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's that aspect. And But the other aspect is I'm concerned about it because I don't think it's a healthy way to live. I, I don't think people should spend 18 hours a day sitting in a chair. That's not – that's – you know, it's I make a natural law argument here, and I know that most people don't know who, who Thomas Aquinas is. But, you know, that's that's not natural for the human person. It's not the right life for a human person. But we live in a liberal democratic age where, you know, the utilitarian preferences that people express are the most important thing. So here's what's going to happen. All those people are going to be in their chairs, and we're going to say to them, that's not a good life. Do you want to come out? And they're, they're going to say, what do you mean come out? I'm, just, I'm so happy. This is so much better than, than the world that you offer me. Don't you dare take me out of here. And then what are we going to do? Right? We don't, have a, we don't have a shared standard of what a good life is that we could use to say, listen, you know, we all agree you shouldn't be doing that so much. <laughs> That's more intervention than our current sociocultural system is comfortable with. And so we're going to face a choice. Either we're just going to lose those people. They're just going to go off and do that. Or we're going to have to look at, look at our, our culture in a different way and maybe start talking about, instead of it being utilitarian, trying to come up with some shared standards of, of morality. Like this is good. This is bad. 
and, and we're willing to act on it. I think either one of those is, has negative consequences. So basically, I'm not pos- not optimistic. Have you identified any cultural differences regarding uh, gaming and how people uh, interact with the virtual worlds? Say, for, the reason why I'm saying that is because I'm I'm thinking of the Japanese who are considered extremely hard workers. Many men, say, for example. And they have that escapism later on with cosplay, because cosplay for all sexes and all ages and the demographics, they just seem to love cosplay over there. Yeah, it's, there are definitely, but Korea is the best, is the case that everybody watches. Korea is either the leading indicator of our digital future or a very, very strange country indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so going back, you know, 15 years, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you know, you think, you think Europeans and Americans and Australians are into virtual worlds. You should see the Koreans. Uh, you know, the, Korea was where people died playing video games because they played them so intensely and so long yeah. that they died of exhaustion. So that's, you know, a Korean thing. And we've always wondered, is that a leading indicator or not? Well, on the one hand, it seems like it's just Korea being Korea in some respects. But electronic sports, esports, which is now taking off, I mean, my university is starting to add electronic sports to its athletics department, which is a big deal in the United States. Uh, and, and so apparently this business of watching other people play video games is becoming a, a mainstream thing. And that was spawned in Korea. Uh, so that, that is one sense where, a, where that country is, is leading. But there are other things that are happening. I'm really surprised at the quality of sort of heroic narrative games coming out of Eastern Europe. Okay, so it's almost, I, I get the sense, like this Kingdom Come game comes from Prague. I, I, I wonder if there's, the Eastern Europeans are still confident enough in the idea of heroism that they can actually, without feeling ironic or sh- ashamed or anything, they're just like, no, it's a hero story. It's a young man who wants to do good, and he goes and he does good. You know, and everybody in Paris goes, oh, you know, that's ridiculous. That doesn't, that's not reality. You know, we're all meaningless atoms. You know, all the continental philosophers are, you know, saying, really? but in, maybe in Eastern Europe, you know, after coming out from the oppressions of the last hundred years, they're like, no, we're going to go for it. We, we're confident about the future. So, I, you know, that's a cultural thing that it seems to be happening the, the surprising appearance of eastern europe as a video gaming culture a video game production culture it's neat yeah i wonder if there's any kind of hidden messages within some of these games if there's any type of given that they're based on a particular culture mm. would you have ever come across anything where there's kind of like conversion towards a certain type of political dogma well that's a really interesting question. So there's definitely a, a set of unconscious, unconscious biases. Uh, the, the, the people who make video games are a certain kind of person. You know, they tend to be 20 to 30 year old white males. And, uh, and that's because, you know, and that's okay because that's usually who's playing them, right? So I, you know, and I, I don't, I don't see any evidence of, of, uh, any issues with that. But it does mean that, you know, if you play those kind of games, you're going to get kind of the, the cultural awareness of those folks. And sometimes it seems kind of sophomoric to me. Like there, some of their notions about what's good and evil are kind of sophomoric. Then there are some developers who are explicitly political, right? They, 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 you know, they're hiding in their game. Like there's a game called Bioshock that really took on the libertarian mindset. And as I, I mentioned before, Eve Online, which is like, they're very pro-libertarian. And, you know, you see this in games. Like there's a board game called Imperial that is basically the Marxist interpretation of the start of World War I in the, in the way it's done. So, yeah, the, the, but it's the, the old question of, you know, if I make a movie that is very heavy handed in its treatment of, let's say, Donald Trump, either pro or against. Well, who's going to watch that movie? Right. It, it, how many minds is it going to change? That's the whole question. I'm not sure that media experiences change anybody's mind rather than sort of they might get somebody stirred up for 10 or 15 minutes. But, you know, conversion of heart is a different thing in longer term. However, having said that, 
most common commentators will agree that in the current atmosphere, we have a generation of young people that is spoiled and, and, you know, whiny to an unprecedented extent. Ten years ago, I wrote a book where I said we have to watch out because people who are raised in video games expect that the moment they enter, they will have something reasonable to do, that the system will come to them and say, aha, you're new in our world. Here's something, you know, really important for you to do. And here's your reward for doing that. And you just, you know, that goes on forward. It's, that's really different from the real world that these young people are facing that sort of says, you know, well, show me what you got. Oh, you don't have anything? Go away. <laughs> and so I wonder, I, I you know, I, I wonder if that prediction I made about, you know, people expecting to be treated as though they have meaning if they were raised in video games, as this generation has been. I wonder if that might explain some of the, the whininess. Um, I don't know. Would some of that have been picked up in your books? Like You have three books, Wildcat Currency, another one, Exodus mm-hmm. to the Virtual World, and then Synthetic Worlds. Would you have discussed that in the Exodus to the Virtual World or touched on that? Yeah, the, the Exodus one is where, where I talk about, you know, just... You know, what's what's the impact on the world of of people kind of leaving our world and spending time over there? It's kind of like with the point I'm, tra- I'm trying to make in that book is when when the when the Europeans left for America, we can look at how that changed America. But it also had an effect on Europe. And, and so in that book, that's what I'm trying to focus on is what what's the impact on our world of all these people spending increasing amounts of time? in these video games. And and one of them is that, you know, people who play video games expect to be employed. Yeah. And I, I like, I reckon, uh, not I reckon, I, I, I believe that it's going to be very beneficial if it's, a, if they're able to get it right regarding education, as you mentioned earlier on, you know, trying to bring it into the, the education system, if we can manage it, but also if we're allowed to, not only for experiments, but for learning. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a whole movement called serious games. And I, I think it's a it's a good movement because it's like, well, let's let's use the lightning in the bottle that is a video game in order to do something good, like, you know, teach people a lesson or change, you know, put change their attitudes or put them in contact with feelings they didn't have before. But the, the problem is most of those games are made by professors <laughs> who don't have the slightest idea how to make anything fun. Yeah. And I've, I've been in a lot of those projects. And what seems to happen is. The well-intentioned people, you know, the governmental agency employees and the the professors, they sit down and they come up with all this content, all these all these learnings that they want people to have. And, you know, they produce something that's kind of like a college textbook, which is pretty dull. And then very late in the process, they turn to a game development company, which is treated with you know very low prestige, said, OK, here's the stuff we want to do. Now you make that fun. And those games are never fun and nobody plays them. So I think the idea is really good. But I think what has to happen is the professors and the teachers and the governmental authorities, instead of trying to make games themselves, they should take games that they know kids already like and modify them or just use them as they are to teach lessons. I think that would be better. And there are a number of games out there that teach profound lessons like civilization is one that could be used to sort of talk about how basically how imperial dominance happens how how nations grow in power and how they project their power and how conflicts come about so that would be one this kingdom come game would be great if i was teaching a medieval history class i would say okay we're all going to go in let's look at the architecture of this church or you know, let's look at how this this castle was built. Let's you can see how the defenses happen. You can see that if this this village is attacked, this is the road that people will take to get inside. Or you know, here are the churches. This is the role of religion played in the society. But I think the way forward there is to basically make the game development and the fun part a much more important part of serious game development. I think once people start doing that, it has real potential. And would that excite you or what, what's exciting you based on say the consultancy work that you're done you're doing with some, is it the artificial or the AI? Um, I mean, some of it I can't talk about, but I'll just put it in broad terms. Um, so video games invented the idea of a virtual currency 
Well, they didn't invent it, but they, they, they came up with the, the current technical implementation, right? There's always been like people trading cigarettes for soap and that sort of thing, which is all virtual currencies. But this, the idea of currencies at scale that trade against real world currencies on a digital platform, that's a video game invention. And we know now Bitcoin has sort of taken that basic idea, taken it out of the game. And this is, by the way, for people looking for innovation, I would say pay a lot of attention to the video game sector because the pattern going all the way back to like Palm Pilots and everything is that things get invented in the video game sector and then they get plucked out and, and put into the real world. And currencies is a great example of that. You know, it goes from gold pieces to Bitcoin. Mm. So there are a lot of folks who are trying to combine blockchain technology and some kind of platform innovation to create like an environment like nobody's doing this, but let me just give you an example. How could you make a better Facebook by having a blockchain attached to it? So you make a, a platform like a Facebook, but you monetize it through a virtual currency. And that's kind of an interesting little combination of, of problems. And the, I think the reason that people get consulting from me instead of real economists is, <laughs> is that if you talk to a real economist about money supply and managing money, the, the real economist is going to start talking about the federal reserve board and selling bonds in the New York, in, in New, you know, New York bond exchanges and, and, you know, the discount window and all this stuff involving real world money management, the managing money in a Bitcoin environment, it's really different. Right? There, there are no financial institutions. It's it's all the quantity theory of money. It's all basically, and, and this has all been handled by the game company. It's a faucet drain economy, and they have about a decade's worth of experience with it. And you know, I've been studying it for 15 years, and it has it has a lot of interesting quirks. Things like uh, how do you account for money exiting the system because it goes into someone's account and then they stop playing. Which is kind of like, you know, what, what if in the real world people would acquire money and then when they died, it disappeared? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it's, I, there's, there is actually some of that, I'm sure, you know, stuff that goes under the bed and stays there forever. Uh, but it, it, it is, it, it's just a completely different paradigm. And so that, that's what creates these consulting opportunities. In terms of being excited about it, like what excites me? Well, I'm really excited about the idea of, you know, a better economy. And I think cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies, currencies everywhere, I think, can make things better. I'll give you an example. We we have a virtual currency in our academic program here. Boy. And yeah, it, and it, the reason the reason we did it was because here's the problem. So we have a game design program and we have artists who make art in art classes and then for assignments and then they throw it away. And we have computer programmers in their programming classes who make these wonderful worlds that have no art in them. And then they throw those away. <laughs> and so, doesn't make sense. How, yeah. So we're like, how, how can we get people in class A to exchange their assets with people in class B during the production process? That would be good for them to learn how to do that. It's freelancing. It's outsourcing. So we created a currency called the crimson because uh, Indiana's colors, one of them is crimson. So it's called the crimson and the students can use it. Like, I'll sell you my art asset for 10 crimsons, you know, and then you'll sell. It basically creates a, a labor market in, in these in creation of assets. And it's been really fun. I mean, and, and it's a local currency, so we don't have to worry about cheating or anything because all the professors see all the transactions. So, you know, we're in a position where it's sort of regulated by social and cultural norms because it's small scale. And I think this is an area of virtual currency that's really being overlooked. Everybody thinks of, you know, blockchain and global currency and all this, and that's all fine. But the, the really interesting applications, I think, are local, local little currencies that you can use to to manage a little, you know, little problems where people should be exchanging stuff and, and they kind of have trouble doing it. That's fascinating. Like, what, what are they able to spend their money on? Do they spend it within the college grounds on actual real goods? So um, it's a digital currency. And so, you know, here's how we we create value value for we make sure it has has value by doing the following things number one as a professor every time i touch a game company i walk away with 50 pounds of swag hats backpacks rings all this stuff 
and I'm not going to walk around. <laughs> Why would I walk around? <laughs> you know, a World of Warcraft hat. But the kids love it. So what I what I do is I auction that stuff off. Okay. So the professors will auction it off for crimsons, and then and you know that gets some interest. That's quite a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. But the other thing we do stuff like you could pay me ten crimsons to get a twenty four hour extension on an assignment. Nice, nice. And that yeah. makes that's valuable. <laughs> So, brilliant. That's brilliant. So if people have, are, have have a lot of fun with it, and uh, it, it, it does. It creates all kinds of really fun things. You know, people joking around, sending one another. Like we had a we had a romance that the the students didn't didn't know that the professors can see every transaction, and so this couple was sending money back and forth to one another with like taglines like "You're too cute." Here's a cute penalty. You're cute, a classic. <laughs> It was it was really cute until they found out that we could see it. <laughs> it they were. <laughs> You're like the gods. <laughs> yeah, it's like I know who's in. Um, I think they do like each other. Actually, it's kind of nice. If you were a god, whether it's a one on games or a Roman or a Greek god, who would you be? Oh gosh, if I were a god, yeah, I'd be Jesus of Nazareth. That's who I'd be. Was he a god though? Is he? Yes, of course he's a god. Come on, you're Irish. I know, but <laughs> he's, he's, he's I, I don't think a human can be a god. Yeah. Well, okay. So, according to the official teaching of the Catholic Church, going back to the Nicene, the Council of Nicaea in 325, Jesus is both God and man. So, yeah, <laughs> you should ask me what saint I would want to be, and I would like to be Saint Columba. Columbo, yeah. Because yeah, I said that earlier. I I'm just wondering, you, could you look? Yeah. You know. If you look into what he did, it was really, really cool, just from a civilizational standpoint, not necessarily from a divinity standpoint. Edward, could that crimson be rolled out throughout all universities, do you think, if it could be adopted? Say, for well, example, my own. Could could we exchange, could we use your platform and apply the same type of stuff to rewarding students or getting them to pay for well, extensions and that type of thing? You know, right now we don't have any control on external things, so it could actually happen organically. And let me explain. So there's another campus of Indiana University in another city in Indianapolis, and they have artists there. And I could see our students paying their students crimsons in order to get their art assets, which then would create the crimson existing there. And it could just it could grow and it could eventually find its way to Trinity I don't know what university you're at, <laughs> but, um, you know, these things, you know, money has a tendency to have a life of its own. However, if that happened, I think it would create problems because then we wouldn't have local control. We wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be able to check on fraud or or just, you know, use social norms to regulate how it's used. And then there's a finite to how you actually use it then, because if you graduate, then you're out of the system. Yeah. And there's a finality to it, and as I said, you couldn't just leave it in a bank account. What could you do? Yeah, you don't well, probably have to spend it. We we only have we've only had this program for a couple of years, but the alumni are kind of proud of their crimson's accumulation, and they stay in touch, you know. And, but I could see them like 20 years from now saying, "Well, here, I, I really like this student. I like their project. I'm going to give them 100 crimsons to help them hire more assets and things like that. That would be okay too." Yeah. Another thing that could happen is there could be a million different microcurrencies and then an exchange market between them. That could happen too. That could happen, yeah. Is is it okay to keep you on for another few minutes? I could ask you a couple of quick fire questions or are you busy and you need to go? Well, I'm going to have to eat. I'm getting hungry. So how about 15 more minutes? Oh, that'd be perfect, yeah. Uh, what I'd love to find out is just a couple of quick fire questions, Edward, is mm-hmm. if you could step into the DeLorean or whatever other time travel machine that you you might have come across in your virtual worlds, if you could step into that and time travel, where would you like to go back to, and who would you like to meet? Uh, Saint Columba. I would love to go back to the sixth century and meet the monks who saved civilization. Saint Benedict would be another one. Actually, now I think I I'd almost rather see Saint Benedict uh, because you know his you know his world was decaying, and so he said, let's go outside of that world and live in a different way. And by doing that, it's created a sphere of order and peace and, and education and arts and books and things like that, that 
nobody else in the world was was saving. So, yeah, that the period of the fall of the Roman Empire is really really interesting to me because I I have to confess I I feel we're in a similar sort of situation not because of politics though but because of technology. I mentioned a couple of books there uh, that you actually wrote. Do you have a book recommendation you? like us to look up and check out and maybe even uh, take a read of? Well, I think Exodus of the Virtual World is the one that I think has gotten less less attention than I think it deserves. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think people enjoy the first one, Synthetic Worlds, more. I would not recommend my book about currencies, Wildcat Currencies, because it was so frustrating. It's like it was a relevant text when I wrote it, but it took so long to get the stupid thing published that now... If you read it now, most everything that's in it is outdated. But I think the stuff in uh, in Exodus is becoming more relevant as time goes by. Do you have someone who, or for example, yeah, on your TED Talk, actually, you refer to J.R. Tolkien. Would mm-hmm. he be an inspiration to you in terms of how he evolved from his academic work into this type of escapism through his books? Yeah, I, I I really love Tolkien. I guess maybe after St. Benedict, I would like to go hang out with Tolkien. But he's such a giant intellectually. I mean, he, his his mastery of medieval lore is just just crazy. And he's a brilliant philologist and great with languages. But he is very inspiring to me because uh, he's he's one of the few people intellectually who's, who connects the idea of fantasy, Roman Catholicism, and uh, you know the contemporary world. I, I, so if you, he has an essay that's kind of foundational for me. It's called On Fairy Stories, and it was a lecture he gave. And he, he, you know, very rarely in his career did he talk about what he was doing. You know, he said he just did it. You know, he just wrote the books. But in that lecture, he, he tries to clarify what, how he sees his own role, and he sort of puts it in the, you know, the divine. The, the the divine order, if if you will, and that, that's really really interesting stuff. Yeah, it was. Um, I actually tweeted there back in January a quote by Tolkien. While he was grading his papers, he found it as a very dull task, mm-hmm. and it actually got him to write his first line of the the masterpiece. I think was the Hobbit. Mm-hmm. I suppose that's what we kind of mentioned at the very beginning of this conversation that you working as an economist. And it was in, in a liberal arts school or in a college and you're teaching three hours of micro and then you found your way into this virtual world just mm-hmm. like the way J.R. Tolkien had done so when he was grading papers and found himself into that virtual world of fantasy. And then you played your games and eventually wrote your books and then your your whole life changed regarding being an economist. Yeah, and I think the exam- similar parallels. The, the example of Tolkien is also... Interesting because, you know, he had a terrible life, right? This is a guy who was orphaned when he was 12. His his father died abroad when he was four. His mom died of diabetes right in front of him, you know, when he was 12. And then he, he ends up on the front in World War I. And, and a lot of what he writes in that on fairy stories is, my goodness, how can you blame people for wanting to be in fantasy when you look at how awful the real world can be? And you know, I, without going into any detail, you know, I, I'm not too happy about my upbringing either. And so it's it's very easy for people who have had a nice life to sit there and say tut tut about folks who spend time in fantasy literature, you know, reading books or going to movies or playing these video games. Oh, tut tut. You know, these people, why don't they come into reality? And it's like, well, you know, as Tolkien said, if if someone wakes up and they find themselves in a prison, how, how can you blame them for trying to get out of that prison and go home? And then, you know, he brings up the idea, what is home? And then it gets kind of platonic, not in the romantic sense, but, you know, Neoplatonism, where home is actually the realm, the metaphysical realm. And Tolkien has this interesting idea that the things in, that, that we see in video games and fantasy literature are not creations of our minds but memories of creatures and things that were kind of present to us before we were born which it's a it's a, an idea from plato but it sort of it lends a reality it's, it's or and other things i have a quote from benedict the 16th who says eternal life is real life 
So there's this teaching that the world around us, that's this isn't real. And if you happen to grow up and it's bad, it's not only real, not real, but it's bad. How can anyone blame folks like me and, and Professor Tolkien for looking to fantasy environments as, as kind of a hint of, of what heaven is like and, and, and how much nicer that would be? So I know that's all kind of very twisted and very few people would walk very far down that path with me, but that it is true that, that Tolkien kind of made open my eyes to that way of seeing the world. I really like it. Edward, I think it's what you're doing is absolutely fantastic. You're doing the economics discipline a great service, and you're after shining a torch in a, lit, a small area of something that will eventually grow and grow over time. And I'm hoping that some people, some economists, and not only gamers, will find your papers and build on it and add to it and build up a whole new type of discipline. And I'd love to see a journal, whether one exists or not, on this type of uh, work in economics, whether it's the economics of virtual worlds or the economics of gaming. I'd, I'd love to see it. And I'd love to also I wish you all the best and I hope that you get to go to many conferences, like gaming conferences, just like a previous guest, Manu Sadia, who has gone on to speak at gaming conferences regarding his book on Treconomics. Mm. And I, I'd love to see all that. And it's only good for the discipline when yes. we kind of lose ourselves in what we actually love, but marry it with the work that we actually do on a daily basis. Uh, I think it's a, a huge respect regarding being able to do something like that and finding your own niche oh. in the marketplace. Thank you very much. That's really, really nice. And thank you for doing this podcast. It's it's a cool idea. Yeah, thanks very much. And I'd like to say, Edward, you are an economic rock star, and I personally really learned a lot from this, and I can't wait. I haven't read your paper yet, but I'm going to take time out later on this evening or tomorrow and take a read of it, and I'll put all the links, all your the links on the books, and I need to the resources that we mentioned on this episode on economicrockstar.com forward slash Edward Castronova. Great. Edward, thanks very much for your time and I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks so much, Frank. Good luck. And enjoy your lunch. (laughs) (laughs) Best of luck. See you. Bye. Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the Economic Rockstar website. If you enjoy this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.